Well, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's great to be here. So this workshop is about discrete Markov chains, mixing times, and beyond. This talk is definitely going to be in the beyond part because mixing times don't really come into play here. Um, it's about cover times. The cover time is the time it takes for random walk on a graph to visit every vertex of the graph. Um, and for this specific problem, which is in two dimensions, for two-dimensional lattices, it turns out that the underlying behavior has a lot to do with branching Brownian motion. So usually when I give this talk, I don't have so much time, so then I have to just go straight to the cover time stuff and just say these magical things I'm pulling out of my hat are actually from branching Brownian motion. So I thought today I was going to make an experiment and first explain branching Brownian motion completely, <laughs> and then explain the cover time business. So this is, this is a bit of a gamble, and I apologize that you are going to be the, the guinea pigs for this experiment. We'll see in the next hour if how successful it actually is. So, so in this preload, which I think is going to be actually quite long, uh, I'm going to explain branching Brownian motion, um, or, or as... Uh, well, I prefer to call it uh, the critical generalized random energy model, okay? Which are actually essentially the same model. For the purposes of this talk, they're the same. Uh, and what is it? You take a tree, um, you give it, let's say you give it branching factor E. Obviously, this tree has branching factor 2, the drawing, but think of it, think of it as having branching factor E, depth N, so you have E to the N vertices, uh, uh, leaves as vertices, and then at, to, each, to each edge you attach a normal random variable with variance square root of two, okay? And then to the leaves you attach the random variable which is simply the sum of all the normals on all the edges from the root on the, to that leaf, on the path from the root to that leaf, okay? So then you have to each leaf, you have associated a, a normal random variable with variance square root of 2n. And then the question you ask is, how small is the minimum value you see uh, on all the leaves? Okay? And this choice here, of the variance choice here is kind of not really standard. Uh, neither is the branching factor. I just chose these uh, because then the formulas are somewhat nicer. The, the phenomena are exactly the same. Um, so what you have here is a correlated field of Gaussian random variables. And they have positive correlations, which means the maximum, if you compare the maximum to what the independent case, when you have this many independent normals, uh, the maximum, or the, in this case the minimum, might be bigger. The, the correlations will cause the field not to be able to go as low as it otherwise might be able to. So that's the effect we're going to study. How do the correlations affect the minimum uh, on the leaves here? And uh, the reason this is, can, the reason for the branching motion in the, so the reason for the Brownian motion in the branching Brownian motion is this. Uh, if you look at the, p at the path from a root, from the root to a leaf, like this, and then you look at the partial sums of these random variables along that path, what do you get? Well, you get a Gaussian random walk. Right, with increments uh, with variance square root of two. So you can plot it like this, and what you have is, well, it's a Gaussian Rhine walk, essentially a, bran a Brownian motion. Right? Um, why is it branching? It's branching because if you take two of these leaves and you look now at the partial sums for both the paths from the root to those leaves, then for a while, these paths will exactly coincide, right? Because uh, the leaves will have some, some part of the paths will coincide, and, and for, those, uh, for those increments, the paths, will, uh, the, uh, the paths of the Brownian motions will coincide. And then there'll be some point where they branch off in the tree, and there they also the processes, the profiles associated to each leaf will also branch, branch and they will evolve independently after that. Okay, so you have, you have a bunch of... Uh, profile processes, profiles being the processes associated with each leaf, and they branch off uh, at these integer times. What? 
Um, okay. So the covariance structure of this uh, field of Gaussians is then given by uh, exactly the length of these paths uh, that are the you know, common ancestors of two vertices. Um, so here, here the covariance is going to be 3 times square root of 2 with my choice of variances, but doesn't really, that's not so important. Um, okay. So the question is then, how do the extrema of this, how do the extrema of this field behave and do they differ from the extrema of an independent field? And if so, how and why? So we can look at a simulation. This is the value of the field um, at the leaves for some pretty large depth, like 15 or something. Um, and for comparison, we have just uh, samples, the same number of vulnerable variables, but sampled from, I, from the IID uh, normal distribution with the same variance. Okay? So they look really similar. So actually, I think that's kind of surprising. I don't think you would expect them to be so similar just when you see the construction of the model because you have this tree, right? But they really look similar. Uh, if you add the density of the normal random variable, you see, as expected, the IID guys really closely uh, match the density, right? That's, that's obvious that that would happen. Uh, you s and here you see, but for the, uh, for the gram, for the tree, you start seeing a, so, some kind of deviation, but quite small deviation uh, from the behavior when you have independent normals, okay? Um, if you start looking at the profile histories, then you see a big difference in the behavior between the two models. So, so, so what is this? This here are all the profiles uh, plotted on the same plot here. Uh, so you see uh, at the start you have very few, so you can actually see the uh, individual paths, and then as you branch you have more and more and more, so you have this cloud here at the end, right? And now I'm comparing to to the case where I have as many paths, but each path is independent, right? You can think of, of this uh, collection of random variables here being produced by simulating a bunch of independent Brownian motions and just taking the last value, right? And that's what I've done here. I've simulated the Brownian motions, and I here have plotted what I see at the end, and here I've simulated the, the branching Brownian motion, the GREM, and I've plotted what I see at the end. Uh, and even though you don't see a very big difference for the end, you see a major difference here in, in the history of the profiles, how they behave. You see that for the tree, you have this kind of cone shape. So the red here is the envelope. It's the, uh, the most extreme point reached by any profile. So you see for the independent case, you have kind of this, this concave shape. And then for the, for the tree, for the gram, you have this kind of pointy cone shape, okay? So to understand the gram, you have to understand what's going on in this picture. So that's what I'm, I'm gonna try to convey to you. Um, first of all, how do you, what's the simplest thing you can prove? It's an upper bound on the minimum. Uh, um, to do this, you just use the first moment method. So you just say, say the probability that you see some guy that is really small, it's the most expected number of guys that are that small. And that you can compute, of course, by linearity of expectation. Uh, and, and you get this number here. And that's much smaller than one if t here is much smaller than n. So that gives you immediately a very uh, easy upper bound uh, on the minimum. It kind of looks like a lower bound, but it's an upper bound on how low the minimum can go, which is how I think about it. I, I'm looking at the minimum because that's more relevant for the, the, the cover time stuff that will come, even though I could, of course, be looking at the maximum here. It might be more natural, but for the cover time business, the minimum is the relevant thing, so that's why I'm looking at minimum here. Um, so, th so this tells you that the minimum cannot go any lower than minus n. Minus n here has another meaning. It's how low you get if you have independent uh, random variables, right? This kind of calculation gives you, gives you a tight bound to leading order in the case where you have independence, right? So this is just saying that uh, the minimum does not go any lower than what 
the independent guys do. Okay? So to try to see if, if you can get uh, the matching uh, or you know, a complementing upper bound, you can start looking at smaller values of t. And you look at this random variable here, which counts the number of, of leaves that go below some level alpha n. Okay? And we know no guys are going to go below alpha n when alpha is 1. But what if alpha is smaller? What happens? Well, we can compute the expectation like this. And we find that the expectation is this value here. So whenever alpha is less than 1, you have exponentially many leaves that go below that level in expectation. You don't know if actually uh, there are this many leaves that manage to get that low, but the expected number is this. And it's something which goes to infinity, of course, if alpha is less than one. But the question is, is does this reflect reality? Okay? And uh, for the upcoming discussion, I want to make the comment that what am I asking here on the level of paths? On the level of paths, I'm asking for this path, this trajectory, to go from zero all the way down to alpha n, which is a large deviation from Brownian motion. It's really hard to do that. And how does Brownian motion do that? Well, if it's forced to go this low, then it's going to essentially follow, uh, well, it's going to be a Brownian bridge whose mean is, is going to be this linear function interpolating between zero and the endpoint. And then it's going to have fluctuations around this mean, which are of order square root of n at, in the middle, where they're the biggest. So the fluctuations are very small compared to how far down it's going. So if you zoom out, it's really just going straight down in a straight line. Okay? That doesn't really enter into computing this probability. This is very simple, but we will see on the next slide that uh, it, it does become important. So to try to uh, figure out does this expectation actually capture reality, of course you want to start, uh, the, the, the natural thing to do is to try to use the paley zygmunt inequality which tells you that if you can bound the second moment and prove that it's of the same order as the for first moment squared, then you really do have random variables that manage to go that low. Okay? So if you can uh, bound the second moment, you're fine. So I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Uh, it's not going to work out. We're not going to get, well, it's not going to work out in the sense we're not going to get a matching uh, upper bound from this, um, from this calculation, but we're going to get something. We're going to get that if you let alpha be any value up to this number here, then the first, second moment is going to be the first moment squared. It's going to work out, and you're going to get a bound. But then there's going to be a region here where the second moment is going to be much bigger than the uh, first moment squared, and this paley sigmund bound is not going to give you anything. Okay. So let's see how, how that plays out. Um, so we're going to see that, yeah, we're going to see that here we see nothing because the expectation tends to zero, so we know we don't have any profiles that, that manage to go that low. Uh, here the Paley sigma is going to tell you that actually both the expectation and the random variable itself tends to infinity, so we do have lots of, lots of profiles that make it this low, and we don't know what happens here. Okay. So when you're computing the second moment, what are you doing? You're computing an expectation of a number uh, of pairs. How many pairs are there where both profiles manage to go really low? Right? So on the level of a, of, of the, of a picture, you're looking at how many pairs manage to go start here zero, uh, and then at some point, you know, they branch, they do something here, and then they both end up really low. Okay? So this is kind of a, a large deviation calculation, which means you should essentially look at what's the best way for these profiles to do this, what's the least costly way for them to do it, and whatever cost that is, that's going to give you, uh, first of all, the probability of, of this kind of event, and then it's going to give you uh, the expectation as well. So what kind of behaviors could we imagine seeing? Well, here's one possible behavior. Let's say up to the branching point, uh, the um, profile goes up a bit, and then they both gun it down like that. Okay? Um, 
by the way, the only thing that matters is really what you do, at where you, and where you go, where you are at the branching point, right? Because before the branching point, after the branching point, you just have, branch, you just have running motions, which are independent. So you know the behave, what the behavior is going to be. They're just going to go straight. Uh, the question is really, where do you, at which level are you going to be when you branch? Okay. Now this kind of behavior is clearly very stupid, because you're working against yourself at the start. You know, you're, you're going higher, which means you're going to work a lot harder later. So that's clearly stupid. So if you work this out, you see that there are exponentially few such pairs. Okay. Here's another. Here's another alternative. What if you just follow the straight line? You just go down at a straight line as the first moment does. Interestingly, if you do this, oops. Uh, so my software just crashed. Bear with me for one moment. There we are. Okay, let's go back to where we were. Right. If you just follow a straight line. Interestingly, if you do that, it turns out the cost is exactly the first moment squared. Okay, so if this was the the kind of most efficient behavior, you'd be happy because then the, this would behave, or this, this second moment would behave as the first moment squared. The problem is that obviously, actually, it's going to be better to go down faster at the start and then go down a bit slower after you branch. Why? Because uh, you're paying. Here you're paying the price of going down fast only once, only for one particle, because the, the two trajectories uh, coincide. Here you're paying the price twice for two independent paths. Right? So it's more efficient to work harder before branching and work a bit less after branching. So this is going to be the best way for two profiles to both go low. And you f if you do this calculation, you find that it's exponentially bigger than the uh, first moment squared, when alpha is above this value here. Actually, when alpha is smaller than that, actually, uh, the extra, w you know, the, the gain you get by going a bit lower turns out to be negligible and doesn't really affect uh, the order of the expectation. So you still have the second moment behaving as the first moment squared, but if alpha is, is bigger than that, then the extra gain you get by going lower is something really significant and it makes the uh, second moment be much, much bigger. Right? So this explains why this simple second moment method gives you uh, these, these kind, well, gives you this bound, which does not match the lower bound. So what you, and what? So you, you know that the minimum should be somewhere, it has order n, it should be somewhere between the two constants, you don't know where, where it should be in that interval. Okay? Um, and the reason you only get this and not something better is that in this picture here, the second moment essentially is counting the number of profiles that do this, that, that go first really fast and then a bit slower. Right? So this is um, a bit strange in a way because the first moment, in the first moment, we're, we're counting guys that go down with a constant speed. The first moment is, the, is the, the, uh, the main contribution is the guys that do this, right? And in the second moment, the main contribution is guys that do something else. So it's like we're counting different things in our first moment and second moment, right? That ca seems kind of silly. So what you can do is you introduce a truncation where you say, I'm only going to count those profiles that go really low, but also stay really close to this line here. So give them some space, something larger than the square root of n. So this tube here should have something, uh, should have variance, should have 
height or you know, width larger than square root of n to give it space to move a bit, but not too much. Uh, and since when you introduce this restriction, actually, for the first moment, you're not changing anything because the, the profile can still do what it wants to do, which just goes straight, right? You're not really changing anything, so you still have the same uh, order, uh, uh, the same asymptotics of the expectation. However, for the second moment, you're forbidding what it wants to do, right? The profiles want to, want to do this. They want to go down first, fast, then slower. But that's, that means they're going to cross out of this tube. So you're forbidding this. So instead, in the second moment, now the dominating contribution comes from guys, well, they still, they don't quite go straight because they still use all the space they have. So they do go down a little bit to the end of the tube, but they can't go further than that. And it turns out that if you only let them do this, then the second moment does behave uh, as the first moment squared, okay? And therefore, with this truncation, uh, using the paley sigmund inequality, you get an, uh, a lower bound which matches the upper bound. And you can show that the minimum uh, you see on this field just is, uh, is close to n, okay? So this result uh, was originally proven, I think, by McKean. And remember what this is saying. The right-hand side here is what you would have if you had independent normal random variables, right? So this is saying that the minimum behaves as if each of your profiles were independent, even though clearly they're not. But it doesn't, it does, the correlations don't seem to affect the leading order. Okay. So next question, next question is, of course, what about the sub-leading order? So the first thing you can try to do is try to be a bit, bit more careful in your uh, first moment upper bound in the simplest calculation we did as a start because actually there's a small amount to gain there still uh, because when we did this calculation, we actually didn't, I only used this exponential part of the tail of the Gaussian. I didn't use the fact that in the Gaussian tail, you have also this polynomial guy. If I also take into account that guy, uh, then I find that um, if I look at the level, which is n minus alpha log n for some alpha, then the expected number of profiles I see that get that low is actually uh, n to the two alpha minus one half. And this minus one half is something I gained simply because of this polynomial term, right? So if I look at uh, alpha's that are um, smaller than, um, than a quarter, so in, in this region here. Um, well, let's say, so before what we knew uh, was that you don't see any profiles after this point, after point n, okay? Um, what we can say with this improved first moment bound is that we actually don't see any profiles uh, above the value where alpha is a quarter, because if alpha is, uh, so if I have less than a quarter, this tends to zero. So well, everywhere here in this interval, the, expe the expectation tends to zero. So we don't see any profiles that make it this low, okay? So we gained uh, this a quarter log n. Um, previously, we saw that this, this truncated counter random variable tends to infinity uh, up to a macroscopic distance away from n. So up to, you know, for any epsilon, greater than zero, you can say up to that point, you do see some profiles making it that low. And now we have a gap here where the expectation of the number of guys that make it that low tends to infinity, and we, we don't know if that actually reflects the true behavior. We don't know what Z actually does here. So to, do, to understand this, we need to understand uh, this picture, okay? So we need to understand, so we need to, we're gonna use the fact that we have this, we see this shape here, right? So where does this shape come from? Where does this cone shape come from? Um, so I'm gonna tell you where we're going, just uh, so you know uh, uh, what the actual result is. We're gonna find that actually the real order of the minimum with subleading correction is here in between. It's strictly smaller than, uh, than this, min this minus a half log n. 
so th the f a quarter is actually a, a three quarters. Okay? So why does it end up being that? So it's about understanding um, this shape here for this, this envelope, this red, th uh, this, these red lines. So how can we prove that the envelope has this shape or something like that shape? Well, if we fix a level, it's very simple to, to uh, get a bound on how far out uh, the profile that gets the lowest can get by that level, right? So here, xik is how, it, it's the value of the profile at level k, at time k. So just using the first moment upper bound, uh, I can bound this like this. Uh, the, the value at time k is just a normal with a variance square root of n, square root of 2k. So I can, uh, bound it, I can bound the probability, this probability, by this quantity, which is much smaller than 1 as soon as t is at least is much, more, much bigger than k. So this tells me that this gives me a way to uh, actually show that, not, that this red envelope here actually is never going to go below this red bar. Now I can do this not only for one level, but for all levels at the same time, okay? So the probability, that's, the probability that some profile at some level goes below this, this minus k, and let's give us some, some space, let's give us a delta, I can bound that by the sum over the levels of, these, uh, of this first moment bound I had on the previous slide, right? And uh, what happens is that the k here cancels exactly the k there, and I'm left just with the sum of e to the minus 2 delta, right? So I can make delta, so if I make delta, say, log n, then this, this will tend to 0, right? So I can take my, my line, just shift it down by delta, which is a very small quantity, it's just log of n, and I get a barrier which I can prove that no profile will ever cross. So what does this mean? What does this mean for the behavior of one profile? If I take just one profile and I plot it like this, um, we're interested in the profiles that go low, that manage to go all the way down to the vicinity of minus n. Okay? So they, so if we condition on that, we just get a Brownian bridge which goes from zero down to minus n. Okay? It fluctuates like this with fluctuations of, of order square root of n. But from the previous slide, we know that there is a barrier here. So this contradicts the fact that the process wants to stay close to its mean and fluctuate with, with, with fluctuations of, of order square root of n. Because if it does that, it will cross the barrier. And we just argued that that's, that cannot happen. Right? So actually, if a profile wants to go really low, what it has to do is stay away from this red barrier. In doing so, it needs to do something, it needs to behave in a way which is not optimal. It's not the optimal way to go low. There's, so there's a cost involved. And you can quantify the cost uh, by looking at the probability of avoiding the barrier conditioned on ending at zero, so ending at the small level minus n. And for a Brownian bridge, this kind of probability behaves like one over n, one over the length of the interval you're looking at. So if you plug this in now to your first moment upper bound, this knowledge, uh, then you can, you realize that you can get away with just counting uh, those profiles which go really low, but also avoid the barrier, right? And if you compute this, this expectation, then you have this extra term here, which comes from the fact that you have to avoid the barrier, which gives you an extra one over n in your expectation. So the expectation becomes smaller. And if you look for which values of t will this go to zero, um, well, if, if t has this form, then you find that the expectation is going to be uh, n to the 2 alpha minus a half. That's what we had before when we did not take into account the barrier. But now with the barrier, we have a minus 1 there. So this is going to be much less than 1 as soon as alpha is less than 3 quarters. So this proves that the minimum 
never goes lower than this. And this is higher than uh, the minimum level for independent random variables. So you've shown now that the minimum doesn't uh, go as low as the independent guys do. So now we're in this situation. We've proven that above this, above this threshold, the expected number of guys when you add the truncation goes to zero. So you know you don't see any guys there. Uh, for this really low level, you know from the previous argument, the previous second moment truncation, uh, that you do see lots of guys there. What about this region? Here you know that the expected number of guys with the barrier truncation tends to infinity, but you don't know anything about do you actually see any profiles that make it that low. Um, so for this, we're going to use a slightly different truncation, which is going to arise uh, from this picture, um, which is about how, what's the true strategy for a profile to go low, right? We said it's not just going to uh, follow this, this straight line, which is the mean of the condition process. Uh, it's going to stay away from the barrier. How will it do that? Well, it's not going to do this. It's not going to just cut off its downward fluctuations, right? That would be stupid, because if it does that, each time it's close to the barrier, it has a pretty good probability to cross it. So this is going to be an exponentially costly strategy to avoid the barrier. Actually, what it has to do is stay far away from the barrier. So it's going to follow this kind of uh, bump. So the mean is going to become this kind of bump. It's going to fluctuate around that curved mean. Um, and this means that you can actually shift your barrier. You can, might as well just count guys uh, that don't go below this curved barrier, right? Because if someone stays away, stays above this straight barrier, they're also going to stay, stay above this curved barrier. Right? So that gives us uh, our truncation for our uh, second moment lower bound. We're going to look for uh, guys that avoid uh, this curved barrier. And when we require them to stay above that barrier, we're not really changing the first moment because we're anyway, the process can still do what it wants to do in the situation. Uh, but it does change the second moment because, you know, this is what the process would like to do. This is what this pair, this pair of points would like to do. It would want, like to go first really fast down and then with somewhat slower speed. It can't do that. It can't even do what we were asking before. It can't even follow just a straight line. It ha ha actually has to go up. Has to, it has to go slower up to the branching point and then down faster. So this is going to be a very costly way for the pair to achieve this, to go really low, and it ca causes the second moment to behave as the first moment squared. So just paley sigmund inequality uh, then gives you that the minimum really behaves as this n minus 3 quarters log n, plus some lower order, which we have yet to determine if there is any or not. So this result is due to Bramson, uh, and the way to explain it that uh, I've been using now is, well, I've learned it from, uh, from these guys, from Argan, Bovier, and Kistler, who have a series of papers uh, on branching Brownian motion. Actually, this lower order is just order one. It's, if you recenter the minimum uh, by this quantity, it's tight. Uh, but you don't get that from the argument that I, I gave you. You have to be a bit, uh, uh, a bit more clever if you want that. So here's the summary of Graham. To get the leading order uh, of the minimum of the gram, you just use first moment, stupid first moment. Uh, to, get the, to get a lower bound for the leading order, you need to use a truncation, which is you ask the profile to descend at a constant uniform speed. Right? To get the sub-leading order, to get the correction, uh, you need, uh, for the upper bound, you need a truncation by this linear barrier here. You need to stay away from that barrier. Uh, so you get this, this curved uh, shape. And for the lower bound, you need to truncate by this, by this curved barrier. Right. So that's Graham. Any questions about Graham? Then we can finally get to the actual so topic of the talk, which is cover times. Okay. So 
What does this have to do with cover times? Well, we're going to see. First, let's, let's uh, look at the problem. So we're looking at random walk on the two-dimensional torus of side length n. And the cover time is the time it takes to visit every vertex of the torus. So this is what it might look like. Um, if you simulate this, so you have this kind of nice fractal shape of the trace of running motion. If you run up, up until a very, not very long time, then it hasn't covered much. Uh, then, you know, here it's covered quite a lot, but it still has quite big regions uh, which are still left uncovered. Um, here it's really dense. It's still not quite there, right? It's still not quite covered. If you run to even longer, it's going to actually cover. And the question you ask is, what, what are the asymptotics of the cover time if you let the side length tend to infinity? Okay. So this has been uh, studied by of various people. So the first result I want to mention uh, is by Lawler. So he has these bounds. He, you take the rescaled cover time. So I'm taking the cover time, I'm dividing by this quantity. Uh, why, why am I dividing by this? Uh, that's the expected time it takes to hit one point, right? So if you take one point in the torus, the time to hit it is going to have expectation this. Since the cover time is the time to visit every point, you need more time. How much more time? Well, it turns out you need a log n squared factor more time, okay? And Lawler has these upper and lower bounds, which where the constant does not match, but it gives you the order. Uh, then we have a result by Dembo, Perez, Rosen, and Saituni where they close this gap and they showed that actually it's the upper bound which is the correct one. So the rescale cover time really behaves like log n squared plus possibly some lower order terms. And this gives you the right constant. Now the thing I, um, so then obviously the question is are there any, any subleading corrections? So there's a conjecture it appears in print, for example, in, in a paper by, by Jean Ding, that there should be a correction of the form log log n with some constant in front. Uh, but there was no conjecture for what this constant should be. Um, so actually, our result for this model is not a result, it's just another conjecture. <laughs> that the constant here, uh, first of all, this is true, that you have a log log n, and the constant is 1. Um, and that's kind of weak, right? Just why am I giving a talk about a conjecture? Uh, well, we have a theorem, we have a result uh, which we can prove for, branch, for Brownian motion on the Euclidean torus. Okay, so then we can prove this. Well, this, you know, it's a, the statement is a bit different. I, did not, I haven't written it uh, exactly. It's just, but it says it's essentially the same. The cover time behaves as its, as its leading order, which corresponds exactly to this leading order minus a correction term, which corresponds exactly to this correction term and has constant one in front. And then we show that it's this plus possibly lower order terms. Well, there shouldn't be any lower order terms, but we, ha we, cannot, exp uh, uh, we ha cannot prove that. Okay. Uh, sorry? Yes. Right. Yes, so you, this is, uh, it's the time it takes for running motion to come within distance epsilon at every point, which is the same thing as the sausage uh, with the radius epsilon covering the whole torus. So that we can actually, we actually have, have a proof. Uh, this leads us to you know, make this, this, this conjecture. And in fact, uh, our method here for this, as a heuristic, applies perfectly well also for the two-dimensional case. Right? The reason it works, the reason we did it uh, for the Continuous case is it helps us in a few places with, with technicalities. As a heuristic, the argument works just as well here. And since this workshop has the, is about discrete Markov chains, I can't talk about this. So I'm going to give you the heuristic <laughs> for the discrete result. And anyway, that doesn't change anything. I mean, I, in, 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 I would never anyway have gotten, if I was speaking about this, I would never have gotten to the details where we actually use the fact that it's uh, continuous. So, you know. 
Yeah, this is the theorem we proved. Ah, right. So, okay, that's correct. So, so the Ding, uh, in, in the paper where he conjectures this, he has a sharper version of the DPRZ result. So he has a, a, a sharper bound on, on the error here than what was in the original paper. Okay. Uh, I think it's, maybe it's on, of the order log log n even. I think, I think it is. Um, right, okay. So why all this talk about the constant? Who cares what the constant is? Uh, Actually, that's not the, the real point, what the constant is. Uh, the point is that to find out what the constant is, uh, you really have to find out what's the true behavior of how covering happens. And as you can guess from my long preload, it's gonna be something which is very related to branch running motion, to the gram. So let's see how that plays out. Um, so in what follows, let's let, let this uh, mean hitting time of a point, let's call that mu, um, so then, for example, uh, the conjecture uh, says that the rescale, if you take the cover time rescaled by mu, this behaves like log n squared minus this correction term, right? So to look at these questions, the right thing to do is to look at the occupation times of vertices uh, in the torus, so local times. So run your random walk up to this time, t times mu, and then look, and then you plot the local times or the occupation times of, of all the vertices in the torus. So what I've done here is that I've given each pixel an intensity which depends on the local time of that vertex. So these kinds of purple colors means high occupation time. So in these regions, uh, the process, the random walk, spends lots of time here. And these kind of uh, yellow red colors, that means low occupation time here. So here the binary motion spends little time or maybe no time. And that's of course the interesting question, are there any regions where binary motion, where, where random walk spends no time at all? Those points have not been hit, right? And if, if there are any points in this, if this field ever hits zero, if you ever have a zero value, that means uh, that some points have not been hit and the cover time has not yet happened. On the other hand, if, the, if in this field you only see positive values, then every vertex of the torus has been hit and the cover time has happened, right? So you're playing this game, you're varying T to get upper and lower bounds on the cover time. First of all, uh, let's see that you can get a really simple upper bound, which is the same upper bound as I was showing you before, uh, the simplest one for the gram. You just look at the expected number of vertices which have zero occupation time. You can compute that uh, it's n squared, the number, times the probability that one vertex has zero occupation time. That is gonna have an exponential tail, okay? Uh, and that makes sense because, um, because it's essentially the tail of the hitting time of a vertex, right? And you would expect that to behave uh, as, as an exponential random variable, at least if the hitting time is much larger than the mixing time. So, I, I gotta mention mixing times. Okay, but that's the only time I'm gonna mention mixing time. <laughs> because the mixing time here is actually a little bit bigger, not much bigger, uh, sorry, mix time is a little bit smaller, not much smaller, but a little bit smaller than the hitting time. You do have exponentiality of hitting times. So you get this expression here for the probability. Uh, and this is much less than one if t uh, divided by mu is much bigger than log n squared. And this gives you your upper bound. So this is the upper bound both from the Lawler's result and from the Dembo Scalis Dorsen Cytunian result. And of course there's more work here because you have to actually get a good result about the about how close hitting times are being are to being exponential, and you have to um, um, also take care of uh, certain uh, concentration of excursion times. I mean there's there's a lot of stuff going on under the hood here, but conceptually it's really the same as the most simple upper bound for the gram, okay? So let's look at Lawler's lower bound. So Lawler's lower bound is simply the second moment method. You just look at uh, the number of vertices that have not been hit by a time of this form, right? And you know that if alpha is one, 
then you don't see any vertices that have not been hit. That was the previous slide. Uh, but if alpha is less than one, then you see that this expectation uh, is n to the two one minus alpha. So in expectation, you have many guys that have not been hit as soon as alpha is less than one. Uh, and it turns out that the second moment does behave like the first moment exactly if up to a half, up to alpha half. But as soon as alpha is larger than a half, the second moment starts exploding with respect to the first moment squared. So you don't get any bound from the Paley signal inequality. So this gives you Lawler's lower bound, and we have this familiar picture of we know that from this point on, uh, we have an expectation tending to zero, so we have no vertices that, that get hit this late. Here, uh, by the simple first, simple second moment method, we have uh, many vertices that have not been hit, and then we don't know what happens here between, in the gap between a half and one, except that the, in expectation, you have very many vertices that have not been hit. Okay. So to start looking at this, uh, you need to, to start looking at multiple scales in your field of occupation times. So what I'm doing now is, on the smallest scale, I'm just looking at the local times of each vertex, the occupation time of each vertex. But then I'm looking at higher scales where I average this over balls of bigger and bigger size. So this is the size of the ball I'm using. And I play this game, I go, can go all the way up to macroscopic uh, Averaging, where I, macro, where I average over a macroscopic ball, oops, and I can go all the way down back again to a microscopic scale. And I get this very, very beautiful evolution, and the whole point is that in this evolution, you have a hidden gram, a hidden branching bonding motion. So, um, <clears throat> First, let's look at just one point in this picture. Let's fix one vertex and just look how this field evolves at that point. If we do that, it makes sense just to uh, plot it as a one-dimensional process. So you get something like this. As you look at smaller and smaller balls, you get, uh, you get that the occupation time um, of, of, the, of the balls will, st will uh, evolve. And here's a crucial point. If you make this kind of rescaling, you get a kind of quite nice process out of this. Okay? So what am I doing? I'm taking the occupation time of the ball, I'm dividing by the radius, by the area of that ball, and then I'm taking square root. So if I do that, what do I get? First of all, by ergodicity, um, at the macroscopic scale, the amount of time spent in a ball should be proportional to the area of the ball. So these, uh, profiles of each point are gonna start roughly at square root of t. If I run my brown motion, my run and walk up to time t. Then I'm gonna get this evolution, and it turns out that uh, if I make this through scaling, I have fluctuations that grow more or less like the fluctuations of Brownian motion. Okay, so you have small fluctuations that start, and then they get bigger and bigger. And it turns out that the mean of this profile typically is essentially just a straight line starting uh, at square root of t, okay? It's actually a small negative drift, but at these time scales, you don't feel drift, it's just like a straight line. And it behaves like a Bessel zero process, okay? And a Bessel zero process is something that's a lot like a Brownian motion. Uh, the main difference is that if this guy, if this Bessel process hits zero, it stays there. Zero is a sticky point, uh, is, a, is a trap, and that makes sense because if you have zero occupation time for a ball, then all smaller balls are also gonna have occupation time zero, okay? So in this picture, uh, oh, and by the way, I, to get this, I also need to look at a, at a log scale for the radius. So I, I'm having the, radi having the radius here at, at each step. I'm looking at, bo at, at, at the balls whose radii are decaying exponentially. Um, Okay, so I have a profile. So this is starting to look like the gram, right? In the gram, to, uh, for, for each uh, leaf, I had a profile. Here, for each vertex, I have a profile. It's a profile which is a Bessel zero process, which is a lot like a Brownian motion. So that's nice. But what about the tree? Where's the tree? 
So let's look at two points. Let's fix two points and then look uh, at distance of, of about d. If we have two really big balls around these points, radius much larger than the distance between them, those two balls are going to be essentially the same ball. They're going to overlap. They're going to have huge overlap, meaning they're going to have essentially the same occupation time. Right? If random walk is in, this, in any of these two balls, it's usually going to be in the common part. So you're going to have essentially the same occupation time. What about if you have a radius which is much smaller than the distance? Then you might expect that if you condition on the occupation time at a scale where the radius is essentially the distance, if you condition on that value, then as you go down in the scales, the occupation time profiles start, uh, start evolving essentially independently. Essentially because of the strong Markov property, right? What, Barney Mo what the random walk does in this region should more or less be independent of what it does in this region because of the spatial separation. Right? What does this mean if you plot two occupation time profiles? Well, it means you get this kind of picture. You have some kind of pseudo branching point, which is about, uh, on this log scale, it's roughly at log D. And then up to that point, the profiles will essentially coincide. Not quite, they won't be exactly the same, but they will essentially coincide. After the branching point, they're going to start evolving essentially independently. Not quite independently, but essentially. And there's going to be this kind of weird region in the middle where it's neither dependent nor independent. But the main point is that early on and late, you, you're going to have this behavior which is exactly the same behavior as we had for the gram, right? Only here it's approximate, not exact. You don't have exact independence. So this means you can think of the torus as being some kind of pseudo tree. Um, where the vertices of the torus corresponds, corresponds to the leaves here. So, so if you want, uh, and we want branching factor E as before, that means if we want n squared leaves, our depth should be log n squared. So that's why in all these results we see log all the time, and we never saw log uh, except for the correction term uh, in, um, when we look at the gram. Okay? And each of, the, at this, so the, the leaves correspond uh, to vertices. The internal nodes do not correspond to vertices. They correspond to uh, bigger and bigger balls, where the, the biggest macroscopic, this level corresponds to radius n, the next one to radius n half, uh, the next one to radius n, n over four, and so on. Okay. And you don't have this tree exactly, of course, but if you look at the, how the occupational profiles of the vertices evolve, it's as if they were living roughly on this kind of tree. So this uh, allows you to understand a bit why did the second moment method fail for these kinds of alphas. It's the same thing as before. The strategy, uh, if you have these two profiles and they want to both hit zero, then they, have, they can take this strategy, which is, uh, a more efficient strategy than just going straight down. And because of that, the second moment ends up being much bigger than the first moment squared. So that's really why uh, this Lawler did not get anything better than alpha half. So the solution is to introduce a truncation. It's the same truncation as for, for the Gram. You make the occupation time profile stay in a thin tube, not, not too thin, but fairly thin around this straight line. So it has to go to zero, but at a steady rate. And then the second moment is constrained. It can't do the most efficient thing, so it makes the uh, second moment of the same order as the, as the first moment squared. So this is essentially uh, how you prove the result of Delmopier's Rosen Saituni, which gives the lower bound, uh, which is tight to leading order, which matches the upper bound, the simple upper bound. Okay. Okay, and the last. Four minutes, I can now talk about our result, the subleading order. Um, so, we want a barrier. The subleading order for the gram came from the barrier. So, first of all, we need a barrier. Where's the barrier? 
Well, it comes from the same effect as before. If you have, uh, if you look at scale r, uh, if you have balls that are closer than, than at distance r, they're gonna have very high overlap uh, and very similar occupation times. So if you look at the smallest occupation time you see at any scale, it's really enough just to consider a tiling of the torus um, <coughs> uh, where the distance between each ball is something of order r, meaning you have a, 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 a lattice with side, length r, with side length r to the minus one, so you have an, a tiling of size r to the minus two. So if you're looking at the smallest possible occupation time at scale r, it's enough just to look at this finite number of balls. That will capture the full amount of variation you see at that scale because there's this kind of continuity. So the effective, ent effective size or entropy of the kth scale is just e to the k, right? It's the radius to minus two, which turns, works out e to the k. So the effective uh, entropy of scale k is the same as the size of the kth level of the tree of the gram. So this is an important point. Uh, because it means that just using the first moment upper bound uh, um, for in the intermediate scales, as you do for the gram, you can show that actually no profile uh, will ever go into this red region. Right? So, you, so you can get the barrier, and you get this precisely because you can reduce the entropy of scale, uh, of scale r from just the complete torus n squared down to ek which is gonna be something much smaller at the intermediate scale. And it involves, instead of having the uh, large deviations of a Gaussian, it has the large deviations of a Bessel process. Uh, but you can do the computation, and then you get your barrier. So then you, the question is, how does an occupation time profile go really low? How does it hit zero? How does a, 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 how does a random walk avoid a, a point for a long time? Well, to see the behavior, you condition your process to hit zero. This gives you a Bessel bridge rather than a Bessel process. It wants to fluctuate like this, so it wants to cross the barrier, but it can't do that, it has to stay away. This is not the most efficient way to stay away, to uh, go from this large value down to this small value, so there's a cost involved. The cost is still exactly uh, one over the length of the interval. And since we have a log scale on the, on the x-axis here, it's one over log n squared. So then you can play this game with the first moment upper bound, now taking, in, taking into account the barrier. You get this extra term here, which helps you, which show, which, and then this tells you that if, you, if t is at least, if t over mu is at least this, then this expectation tends to zero. So you get the upper bound. So you get the conjectured upper bound uh, for the discrete torus. For the continuous torus, you actually get a, 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 a a rigorous bound, and uh, well, you might have these lower order terms, actually you don't, but we can't exclude them. The lower bound is, once again, a truncated second moment method. You use this kind of bump truncation now, as we also saw for the gram. Um, so, last, 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 last thing is this. This says something interesting about how the random walk avoids a point. Because, as we said, the profile, it's not just gonna do this. It's not gonna cut off its lower fluctuations. It's gonna, you have this entropic repulsion, it's gonna stay away from, uh, from the barrier, far away. What does that mean for the actual random walk? It means that what it does to avoid a point is not just stay as far away from the point as it possibly can for as long as possible. That would be if it went straight. Then that it would be doing that, but it doesn't go straight, so it doesn't do that. What does it do? it actually spends a little bit more time than it actually needs to, in, in a sense, in the intermediate scales, which correspond to the middle here of this picture. So it goes a bit higher, it spends a bit more time there than it could otherwise. And precisely because it's kind of saving its energy in the middle, it's, it's kind of resting here in the intermediate scales, precisely because it does that, it's able to avoid the point in the middle for the longest possible time. So, uh, I'll finish there. Um, here's some problems. You can read that if you want. Um, that's it.